Great, thank you very much. It's really good to be here. Almost didn't make it. Okay, um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about lessons that we've learned over the past 10 years of doing open source hardware design, and obviously there are things we could improve. We've been working on some tools to fix the problems that we've been seeing, and hopefully I can motivate it a little bit. It's the first time I'm talking about it, so you know there's a lot of kind of loose ends here, but hopefully I can do a demo at the, at the end, so great. So I'm going to try to motivate our work really quickly. Um, I think we all agree that there's lots of workloads that we are coming up with that needs a lot of compute. Machine learning is an, a great example of that. But there's one problem that general purpose processors are not getting any faster. So a lot of people have been looking at different solutions. Obviously, you know, running things on specialized hardware, commercially available, available ones like GPUs, obviously a thing you do. Um, some people go all the way to go build custom silicon. But there's one problem of building custom silicon. It's, it's the fact that it's just expensive. Um, I think what really happened is as Moore's law was going on, the golden formula was to just get the chip out the door um, so that you can beat your competitor and you sell 100 million copies of it and life's good. Along the way, one big problem is that we forgot, forgot about productivity on how to build chips with a small team. So I've always been saying that we should just copy, blatantly copy the success of software into the hardware industry. So what, what do you mean by that? So I think the best form of building things is to not build new things, <laughs> just reuse things that work. So I think the software world, it's, it's not a foreign concept. The ultimate form of reuse, I think, is open sourcing because you can just grab other people's stuff and you know um, go make something more useful with it, something bigger. And if you want to really enable that, you have to carefully think about interfaces on how you expose your stuff to other people. So abstraction is obviously an important thing and always thinking about com composability of the modules that you, know, you open source and use. Um, and therefore you get ultimate productivity. And you know, I can, I can say all of this, but I have some actual numbers that are backing me up. So. You all know Instagram and probably heard this story a lot, but you know, they become a billion dollar company with 13 people. If you, you know, I actually counted how many people you need um, to build hardware. <laughs> you know, it turns out to be at least more than 14. So, you know, your billion dollar 13 you know, person company is, is already thrown out of the water, you know. Actually, I, I showed this slide to many people and somebody pointed out, you forgot about software. There's no software people here. So just building hardware is at least 14 people. So. so I think the main reason why you can do that is, as you all know, there's a lot of open source reusable things in the software world and a great package manager called NPM. I'm not sure whether everybody knows about NPM. I'll show you some stats about it. If you are not aware of it, you should, you should just go look. Just, there's a lot of tutorials, a lot of videos around it. And it's not just about development, actually. It's ease of deployment, too. Um, software is only useful once it starts running on hardware. And in the software world, people have figured out how to come up with a model, you know, pay-as-you-go type of deployment model where you just throw stuff on Amazon and you can scale up and down as, as you get to a million users. So at Sci5, we've been kind of building parallels to that. So RISC V was you know, obviously the first attempt of getting, our first attempt to getting the open source processor going. Chisel is a tool that we've been using. Um, there's a bunch of open source IPs and we've been start, we started a program called Design Share where it's third party IPs uh, onboarded onto our platform where you don't get to see the source, but at least you get to include it in your piece of silicon. And we've been negotiating very, hard with the IP vendors so that you would get access to all the third-party IPs at a very low cost for a prototype chip. So um, there will be more um, details related to that coming up soon. 
And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about federation tools that you know, we've been building to solve some problems that we've been seeing. And to ease the deployment of chips where you have put together your processor and SOC, we've been building you know, corresponding cloud services that you can go use to actually realize your idea in a piece of silicon. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly emphasize NPM. Um, it's Node Package Manager. There's actually lots of packages. Obviously, the red line is the number of NPM packages. 830,000 packages, as a matter of fact. 10 million users. 30 billion packages downloaded per month. I, I, can, I can almost say all web you know, stuff uses NPM packages. If you go to their website, I went there yesterday, it says, out of the 500 Fortune 500 companies, 500 companies use NPM, so um, it's used everywhere. Um, and there are some arguments, you know, around for massive adoption, you need libraries. So I think a lot of people have been using JavaScript as their main development language, which five years ago I couldn't believe, but I think that's, I accepted that as reality. So the way it kind of works is like this, where you have a package.json file for every package, and you just declare your dependencies here on different packages. And then you, know, you write your source code on top of all the dependent packages. So hopefully I'm repeating myself here. So I think this is a pretty good model to follow. So we kind of been modeling how we should package up hardware source code this way. Okay. Um, when Stefan told me to give this talk, he said you should try to summarize the things that you've learned so far. So I think there are two points that I tried to distill down to, things that we could have done better. So first, libraries, not workspaces. So a lot of the people, when they open source stuff, including you know, us, Berkeley, and Sci-5, you know, we had Rocket Chip and Freedom as our open source projects. Turns out those are workspaces, not libraries. <laughs> we have our own main function, I mean, in terms of like writing your code. And I mean, a lot of people, when I'm trying to use other people's stuff, you don't use other people's main, you just use other people's functions, <laughs> basically. That, that's what it means. So when you're packaging your stuff up, always try to think about how you're gonna package your, your thing into a library. I mean, it's pretty obvious in hindsight, but you know, this is something that we've been thinking about a lot. And also, we've been challenged internally to give access control of individual, individual pieces of the workspace to other people in a different way. It turns out there's a lot of expert control issues, and I think it's just going to get worse. <laughs> so there's um, ample reason why we need to split up our workspaces into smaller libraries. The second one is, um, it's also probably obvious to a lot of people, it's, it's about frameworks. Frameworks, when I say frameworks, it's like whenever you want to use a piece of code, you have to kind of wrangle your thing into the previous thinking, otherwise you can't leverage all the existing stuff. So once you're up to speed on these frameworks, it's, it's very productive, but it may actually become a massive barrier for rapid adoption, which we've been kind of seeing. So it's inevitable that each mature code base turns into a framework. That means you, know, you have a bunch of code and a bunch of you know, stuff. It, it kind of evolves into a code base plus a data format. And I think, I think um, a lot of people been looking at our chisel, fertile, diplomacy, tiling stuff, which I finally named, gave it a name. Um, it's called Craft Framework. <laughs> the DARPA program was also called Craft, and you know it's chisel, so I thought maybe you know it's, it's a crafting framework. So I, I you know I'm just gonna I'm, I'm just gonna name it now. So you know it's uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, but that. Like, not everybody can use a framework even because sometimes your, your IP or whatever you want to contribute to integrate and use together is maybe not written the same language. Maybe it's Verilog, maybe it's a system Verilog, maybe it's a different language. So 
we, we really thought about this hard, and I, I've concluded that we, in order to really make this open source SOC integration a lot easier, we need to abstract one level higher so that you, there, there's a way to compose different frameworks together. So th these were kind of two things that we learned. Um, so in, in conclusion, we, we needed to refactor our entire code base into separate IP and tool packages as fine-grained as possible um, with proper interfaces so that we can compose them very well. And we had to express all of our code base in terms of dependencies of all these packages, tools and IP packages. So we um, worked on very hard for our federation tool suite. So there are three tools that we've open sourced already. Um, the first one is called WIT. It's a workspace integration tool. It's our packaging, it's our packaging system. Wake is our build orchestration tool and language for tool and IP packages. If you want to package up your tools and yet roll all the commands up to one coherent SOC build flow, kind of really need a better tool than make. And, you know, wake is a pun on make, but, you know, that, that's, our, that's our build tool. The last one is called do. It's design unification in hardware. Um, it's, it's a IP data format that captures kind of your generator's information so that you can kind of use all IP packages within your own framework. So these are all the open source uh, repositories. Um, all the tools have been open source under the Apache 2 license. So let me kind of go through one tool at a time. So what is WIT? You can kind of think of it as a hardware package manager for IPs and tools. Um, just a very simple way of explaining it is it's get some modules on steroids. A lot of the times, you know, people ask me, so why, why your own tool? Not NPM, Maven, PIP, Nix, Dpackage, or Repo. You know, we just, we had slightly different requirements and, you know, we wanted to roll something out very quickly. So we built our own tool. Um, we may just go back to using NPM, but in the time being, this is, this is our package manager right now. But the entire thing, again, is the whole principle, guiding principle, and our mantra was to not come up with a SOC framework again. So it's all about libraries and point tools. So if you don't like WIT, you don't need to use WIT. You can throw it away. You can put your own package manager on top of it. You can bring your own tools. You just, you know, at the end of the day, I just need to check out all the dependencies, um, all packages, IP and tool packages, and I just need to build a workspace with it. It's just that WIT, is, WIT was our answer. So the, the way WIT works is there is a manifest.json file with all the dependencies of repositories with their commits. Um, right now, we use the git hashes, but I'm not so happy about it. Semantic versioning really, really helps force people come up with interfaces. So you can also put tags over there too, um, release versions. So then you just work, run a init workspace command, then it will go check out all the dependent um, repositories, and it will build a workspace for you. And then you can operate within the workspace. The next one, um, Wake. So Wake is a language as well as a tool that accepts the language. It's uh, the guy who built it is very proud of it. Um, I don't even know what it means when he explains the language. He says it's an early yet an eager language. I don't know what that means. Uh, just told me it's, it's that. It's a, functional, it's a functional programming language, strongly type checked so that you can kind of come up with abstractions, APIs, and implementations of, you know, those concrete APIs. So it's trying to really put a abstraction layer and um, around all the build commands that will be distributed and con contributed by lots of different tool packages. So a lot of people ask make, you know, why not make or why not Bazel? We, we wanted to come up with something that was very modern and composable, yet not too opinionated. Um, these, these were the two important things that we, that we wanted. We wanted to have a publish, subscribe APIs to decouple the actual tooling from the flow. 
I'll, I'll explain it a little bit further. The, se the, third, the, the second point is, if you use Bazel, um, you kind of have to write all the parallelism explicitly. I forgot their name of the language. It was a Python derivative. Um, you, you had a concept called threads, uh, but we wanted to abstract that away where you can just write all the build you know, rules and the tool would automatically find all the parallelism for you. So you know, that our, our principles were, were sort of different. So you know, this is kind of what I mean. Um, so in the actual simulator, this is the syntax. It's like a functional programming language where you can subscribe to certain methods and you can provide different implementations of the method. So for example, if you want to plug in your Verilator you know, tool, you can provide a concrete implementation of the interface. If you want to plug in BCS, you can also provide a concrete implementation of the simulator run. So this way we can actually kind of provide a good abstraction layer of how the entire tool set of building SOC should fit together. Okay, um, last but not least, um, a little bit of explanation on do. Do is a data format, something like, I, like IP exact, which will describe the IP generator parameter space and all the information that you need to describe the IP. So that with that description, now you can generate a lot of the different views that you need for your own framework. So for example, in our case, we used a craft framework where we need to generate all the abstractions for Scala and diplomacy and all that. Depend based on the do document, the description of the IP generator, the tools would automatically generate views for our craft framework. That means all the Scala files, all those things will be automatically generated so that you, as a user of our framework, don't need to understand all the intricacies of Scala and all that. And there's a lot of tools um, that help you import your IPs into the data format. We can read Verilog, System Verilog, IP Exact, um, System RDL um, type things to go generate the do document. And then there's lots of tools that help you validate the schema of, of the data format. And there's um, export tools to map the do document into different views like Scala, Verilog, IP exact, TLM, and documentation. So we believe do actually is here to fulfill the IP exact promised promises. Um, it's an actual open source governance model and tools are all open sourced. And I think it's um, a pretty good thing to have. So putting all the bits and pieces together, um, before I show you the demo, I just wanted to kind of show you um, what I'm going to show you. So let's assume we have a programmable I.O. IP block written in Verilog. On this side of the processor interface side, let's say we have a AXI MMIO interface and an interrupt going back, and the actual block has these outputs to the SOC side, where there's an output enable and an output data and an input data. So the way this, so there would be a package which describes this PIO IP block and a do document that goes around it. And the way we would test it is we would put this C style test bench around it, which is also a package, which will instantiate a rocket processor so that we can write tests in C to go test all this PIO block. And obviously on the outside, you need to tie all the peripheral, you know, the interfaces that are heading towards the SOC, and we need to put a VIP block over here. In this case, we'll just XOR these two um, bits, and we would just feed it back in so that at least the program can expect some behavior. So there would be a package of this VIP block. There would be a package which describes this, this test socket, the rocket processor, so the test socket will also depend on source code to pull in the rocket processor. So once I check out the PIO IP block, then all the other blocks will just kind of all be checked out and I can go run this program. How are we doing on time? Is there time for a bit of demo? Are you interested in seeing the demo? Okay, all right, I had, I wasn't feeling the energy, so I thought maybe I'd just not do it. Okay.
I was trying to log into the Wi-Fi and ask for my mobile number and then try to put my US number in. It's just been refusing. No, it's OK. Um, I'm using my phone here, so. It's OK. Yeah. Technology kind of works sometimes, you know. 0.6. I'm just trying to get the Witwake tools over here. So the first command I do is, oh, thank you. OK, so I ran the WIT um, tool, just like NPM. I'm just checking out all the different packages. Um, it's taking quite a while. So there's a bunch of uh, packages that it's figuring out as it's checking out all the different repositories. It's reading all the WIP manifest.json files from all the different repositories. And then now it figured out all the right you know, versions. And then after it checks out, it tries to fetch all the dependencies from the internet. So in this case, we're, we've been using Scala. So there's all the associated IV dependencies. So after you ran your WIT checkout command, the whole point is that you know, you would not have to be connected to the internet back back again. It's taking some time. And then there's some additional dependencies that I have to add because we're running it on our San Mateo infrastructure. You know, all the tools and all the external dependencies are declared in a different package. For example, how you run VCS and how you run all the other tools. It's all kind of abstracted into one repository. It feels like today it's checking out more stuff, but I guess I'm on the stage and it just feels that way. So I'm adding it, adding an environment package here. And then I'm gonna call the wake tool. So what happened is in the workspace, now I checked out all the relevant packages here. So the demo block is the, the PIO Verilog block. So the WIT manifest only depends on two packages, but it, recursively went in and fetched all the right packages. So if you go into demo block, I'll show you the RTL of the PIO block. So it's in Verilog. There's an AXI4 light interface here. The IRQs that I've been talking about over here. And the IO pins, O data, O enable, o -enable I data, and a bunch of clock and reset stuff. And there's all the associated Verilog over here. And the VIP is over here, which I connected to the IO ports. It shows that it's real, it's a typo. But yeah, and then now the wake system is, so all the packages that we had has a, some packages, especially the tool packages, have build rules inside it. So Wake kind of took all the Wake files together, and now it populated the commands in the build system of the SOC. And now it's, it found all the parallelism that was exposed within the Wake files. And then now it's just going through and it's building Scala, and then it's building Verilog, then it's building Verilator, it's building the software, it's, then it runs the software on the RTL simulator and it will return the result. So this way, if you have your own IPs, you can kind of you know, extend the entire SOC with your own IP blocks, you can instantiate them. If you have your own tools, like your synthesis tools or your FPGA build tools, you can 
add packages for that and you can freely kind of give it out to other people. You can depend on other people's packages. You can you know, go build your own SOC. If you don't like the craft framework, that's fine. You can use the do document to go generate views for your own framework. You can just use all that and combine everything together. Yet, since the IP blocks are written in a data format now, we can still go work on a common format to describe all IPs. You can use your own frameworks that you like, and it can, we can still leverage all the, all the hard work that we've done together. So this is going to take a while, so I'm just going to go back to the talk. I just have a couple of things left. So yeah, um, so that was all about development. And to help the deployment side at Sci-5, we've been working on cloud services. The first one that we announced is the core designer, where there's a web application to go you know, configure your own cores um, and things like that. The chip designer part, we're building services to take all the feder you know, SOC build framework that was written in the federation tools. There will be associated cloud services that we will build to go do simulation, emulation, synthesis, and things like that, so that you don't need to go own your own infrastructure. You don't need to go own your own tools so that we can build SOCs much more productively. And to probably um, Ted from Western Digital on Tuesday probably talked about this a little bit, but in order to go maintain all the tools and you know standards and the actual um, source code. We've um, also started a nonprofit open source har hardware foundation called Chips Alliance, so that we can go manage you know all these things together um, and work together as a community. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, <laughs> happy to answer them. The mic is very interesting. It's like. Uh, so can you use this framework to give you a more of a fine-grained and easier way to configure Rocket to implement various different um, versions of it? Uh, right. So kind of going back to my point, Rocket Chip was a workspace, not a bunch of libraries that was actually use reusable. So with this new framework, or build tool, sorry, um, we're going to actually slice and dice Rocket Chip up into reusable libraries and a bunch of different packages that you may want to go grab yourself to go build other things. Yes, that was a long way to answer your question. So, um, so eventually that new version of Rocket will be part of this free framework? Which, uh... Yes, Rocket Chip will be split into multiple different packages, reusable packages. Rocket Chip would obviously be reconstructed using you know, the package managing tool and we'll declare a bunch of different dependencies. There will be example tops, which kind of put together rocket chips together. And the way you can add your own IP is either you can write it in chisel as a package and add it to, you know, you can de declare additional dependencies. You can build your own top. If you have your IPs in Verilog, you can write a do document and yet still integrate it into rocket chip very easily. You don't need to learn any of the framework yourself. It will automatically generate all the Scala, you know, goo that you need to go integrate it into Rocket Chip. That's the vision. So do you have a time scale for this wonderful new release? Um, we're working very hard as we speak. I, it's gonna be within three months. As you, as you see, we're not going to do this like shebang, like everything, like one time open source. It doesn't work that way. As, we, as, you, as you've seen, we've been incrementally open sourcing things. And you've already kind of been seeing some wake files and wit files showing up in various <laughs> repositories. It's just, you know, we're in the process of refactoring the entire thing. But it's almost like gutting our entire code base and reconstructing it. So it's, it's, been, a, it's, a, it's been a big challenge within Sci-5 too, to get it done. But it will get done within three months. Yeah, you said, uh, why not use Make or why not use Basil? And I agree. But just another why not use uh, that I would like to ask about. The what? Uh, did you look into Fusoc? Uh, yes. 
Did it? Uh, what it done? I w I'm curious if there is something in particular that didn't fulfill your specifications. Ah, um, if you saw to me felt like a framework again, um, where it was. So as you know, I, one thing, the second thing that I said that I've learned is, you know, rather than coming up with frameworks, um, this time I try to come up with point tools so that if you don't like certain point tools, you can just throw it away and you can just use your own thing. That's why I've been not trying to call it the Federation framework. That's why I've been trying to call it Federation tools. So I think FUSOC um, is very useful in your own, in certain use cases. And I think, um, yeah, those were kind of the things that we thought. And I think FUSOC and, you know, the point tools that we've been using, um, I think there is a way that we can compose them together. Whoa. So does it work? Yes. So it, um, you've been open sourcing, of course, the, the high level of your, of your chip. So obviously the silicon, you can un download the layout, you can not download anything which is basically done beyond the, the high level. Are you having any plans to move in that direction as well, which probably means not using you know, commercial tool which expressly, explicitly doesn't allow you to do so? So was the question whether we've been thinking about actually building silicon with this framework? Is, was that the question? Right, I mean, you advertise on a website, you know, the chip, fabricated chip and so yeah. forth, and you tell it's open source, which is maybe to some people misleading, but obviously you cannot download, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you cannot download the layout, right? You cannot, no. Download, right? No. And you, so anything, for example, placing it out, all this part is still completely done with proprietary tools. Oh, 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 to oh, I see. Yeah, so one of the other motivations of building this this way was so that we can use multiple different tools. Um, so I haven't really been so specific about which synthesis or place and route tools you can compose within this framework. Obviously, within Sci-Fi, we have all the tools, um, synthesis, place and route tools, all stringed together using some framework of ourselves. Those things will be stringed together with Wake with inside Sci-Fi, but you know, those packages may or may not be open. If you have any open source CAD tools, we welcome them as well. So the whole idea is if you are a tool author, you can write a Wake description of how to use the tool, and then some, somebody else who wants to go use your synthesis or place and route tool, they can just declare a dependency, and all of a sudden, all the Wake commands are in your command line so that you can go synthesize it. So I obviously encourage people to go do all those things. And I would love to see a lot of different packages out there that people can go depend on. That was, that's kind of the whole principle of federation tools. Did, did that make sense? Thanks. Is it, is it on? Yeah. Uh, so there were some recent like changes in uh, by Oracle on the Java licensing, and that has caused some stir. Is, how does that? I mean, you're building everything on Scala, right? Which kind of ties into the JVM. Like, how does this affect the whole flow and the open sourceness of the flow? What did Oracle do? I'm not aware of it. Interesting. So, so there were some licensing changes uh, where I think it's m the, the licensing of Java and related technologies is much more restrictive now. Uh, this is especially like harder to get access to it from a from an educational point of view, uh, etc. Oh, I think they are charging for the long-term support uh, versions, right? So there there will be Open JDK yes. available. So as long as there is a JPM that can execute my code, then I guess I'm okay. Well, but thank you for letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> I I really don't want to pull a team which builds a JVM in sci-fi. <laughs> Maybe it's inevitable at some point. Any other questions? Otherwise, let's thank Yuntup again. <laughs>